Okay, thank you very much for being here. Um, today we have an incredible seminar by Mark Serrell of the Jet Propulsion Lab. He will give his own uh, introduction, but uh, Mark is working on the Europa Clipper mission, and he's here today to talk to us about how spacecraft communicate with ground stations, uh, specifically in terms of how their software is organized. Uh, so with that, Mark, uh, please take it away, and, and thank you so much for your time. Oh, no problem. Glad to do it. Thank you for inviting me. Michael, it's really a pleasure to be here. So as Michael said, my name is Mark Sorrell. I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. My current job that I've had for about almost five years now, about five years, has been uh, working on the Europa Clipper mission. Uh, and more specifically, I'm the downlink systems engineer for the Europa Clipper mission. So. It's my job to make sure that we know end to end how we can get all the data that the science instruments take back down to the ground and distribute it. Um, so I've been doing this sort of work on, this is not my first mission doing that sort of work. I also worked on the Spitzer Space Telescope in a similar role. Uh, before that, I worked on the Cassini mission, uh, but more in a ground data systems role in that for that mission uh, so what i'm going to talk about today is organizing the data exchange between the spacecraft and the ground and in particular the way i'm going to talk about it is a little different i'm not going to talk about telecom so i'm not going to be talking frequencies and decibels and uh you know um uh bandwidths and things like that. I'm more going to be talking about the software layer. So I'm going to assume for this talk that we have a separate telecom engineer who's taking care of all of that at the telecom RF level. And I'm going to be talking about what happens above that level at all the different layers of software. Um, so today's talk, this talk, today's talk is actually intended to be part one. Um, with any luck, we'll, we'll be uh, having a part two of this talk sometime in the spring. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is really two things. I'm sort of going to introduce the concept of layered interfaces, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about space link protocols and all the different protocols that you might run into um, if, you're, if you're designing such a system. Um, by the way, I would encourage, um, and Michael, tell me if you feel differently, but I would encourage people to ask questions sort of while I'm talking rather than saving them to the end. That's a great idea. Uh, we, we love for these to be more like conversations and encourage students to speak up if ever there are questions really at any point, if that's all right with you. That's fine with me. I would, I would prefer that actually. So wonderful. Thank you. Don't, don't worry about interrupting. Just go ahead and ask and we'll try and, uh. Uh, I'll try and answer them to the best I can. But we're going to talk about two things. One, I'm going to give just a, a, a brief introduction to what layered interfaces are. I find that unless you're a software person and you have the specific kind of software background, you may not have encountered this stuff before. Um, so a basic introduction, and then I'll talk about the particular space link protocols that are common to use. I don't know if these are going to be the protocols that you guys use on ABEX. That's a different question. But these are all standard protocols that just about anybody in this area would recognize. And once you understand the concepts, that's really more important than the particulars of the protocol. Um, in the spring, the, the point is I, there are some other concepts. I'm doing a very basic point-to-point -point interface here. So no intermediate systems between the ground station and the spacecraft, but that's not the whole story. So in the spring, I hope to cover sort of beyond the space link. In other words, how do you get this, the data from the ground station to your mission operations center? Or perhaps how does the spacecraft get the data from its RF system to its payload? So those are sort of the, the first and last mile on either end of the space link, if you will. So this is the number one question you will run into with your, with your customers, the people operating your, your science instruments about telecommunications. Where's my data? That's, that's all they care about. They, they don't care about how it works. 
or how it gets there. Do they just want to know where it is? So, but in order for, for you to answer that, you need to understand sort of what's going on. I've mentioned a couple of, of times this concept of layered interfaces, and you'll see that in a moment. But the reason we do layering is this uh, 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 quote here. This guy is named Edgar Dijkstra. He was a uh, computer scientist and mathematician. And he, he summarized it pretty well. So he's talking about software here specifically, but um, this applies to all sorts of engineering. So maybe I'll give you guys like a minute or so to, to read through this. Um, I've, I, it's unfortunately, it's kind of a wordy quote. So why don't we take a few minutes just to read through this and Michael, maybe you can give me a, a signal when you think everybody's done. Will do going at it myself. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, I think I know what you mean by the separation of concerns now. Right, so your problem has a bunch of different aspects to it, and you have to be able to deal with them one at a time, or at least as close to one at a time as you can get, and then it's a separate issue to integrate them and make them work together. So I, thought, I think this is really the, I, I wish he had been a little more concise, <laughs> but I think it's a really good point that he has here. Um, so what are some of the concerns that I'm going to be talking about today? So for, for telecom systems, this is the list of concerns. You have error detection, correction, accountability and acknowledgement, um, bandwidth efficiency, uh, multiplexing, routing, flow control, authentication and privacy. All of these things are things that you potentially could address in your telecom system, depending on the needs of the mission. So not every mission addresses every concern on this list. Um, the simpler the mission, the fewer concerns you'll need to worry about, but this just gives you a sense that there are a lot of them. And there are probably more, I'm sure there are more than I've, I've listed here. But I just wanted to give you a sense of what I meant by a telecom concern, give you some concrete examples. You know, uh, and, and you'll see some of these during the uh, the rest of this talk, error detection and correction and uh, data accountability in particular um, are some of the some of the things you'll, we'll be talking about. Authentication and privacy that those have not yet reached um, at least missions I'm familiar with yet. So that would involve encryption with your sending encrypted messages to and from your spacecraft. So. There is out in the world something called the open systems interconnection model. This is a model of layered interfaces. And what they've done is they've divided uh, telecommunications interfaces into seven layers shown here. So I'm gonna be talking about layers two through seven on this list. Um, layer one is where you would get yourself a, uh, a physical, uh, you know, where you would get yourself an RF engineer uh, to to do uh, to do what uh, to do that analysis and design. So, but even here, I mean, I just stole this chart from Wikipedia. You can go look up open system interconnection on Wikipedia, and um, uh, you'll find this table. But you'll notice that even in here. Uh, they, they start breaking down the, the separation of concerns. So each layer here has its own concerns that it addresses. That's the point. In other words, you're not, you're not trying to address all the concerns at once. Each layer has its own set of concerns that it takes care of and doesn't care about anything else. Now, that's the perfect world way to say it. That's not always completely true, but that's the idea. That's what you're aiming for. 
So uh, the transport layer here might take care of uh, segmentation, acknowledgement, and multiplexing, whereas the presentation layer might be character encoding, whether it's ASCII data or you know uh, Unicode data or data compression or encryption and decryption would be handled at that layer. So you don't have to follow this pattern exactly, but the idea is that each layer takes care of some of the concerns and then you compose your stack. That's another term that you have to, that I wanna introduce. Um, the stack is shows, the stack in a communications protocol sense tells you which protocols you've combined on a particular space link. So you combine the stack of protocols that are in total going to address all of your concerns. So, so again, physical layer is not my area of expertise, uh, but first I really wanted to start with a, a terrestrial example, something that's maybe a little more um, familiar. So, uh, Michael and I met at a at a at an IEEE conference a few months ago, and so I have an example here of an author submitting a paper to a conference. And what they're using, what they're doing, is they're sending <clears throat> a PDF file from their web browser to the web server. And so, at the high level, that's what happens. That's all most users ever think about. They don't know or care what's going on underneath the hood, but I think in this core, in this sort of lecture, that's what I want to get at is what goes on under the hood to make this happen. So all the user sees is the file moves from A to B. Under the hood, we might have something like this. So here I'm showing one, two, three, four, five layers. There are or can be more than five. I certainly stop at the Ethernet layer at the bottom. There's certainly at least one layer below that. You know the physical copper um, that that transmits the uh, you know the the electrons that carry all these messages. The other thing I want to point out is <clears throat> about this diagram and everything that I'm going to be talking about in these slides is that everything here is very simplified. So if you decide that you want to do this sort of work, and you come back to me in six months and said, you know, Mark, that was a great talk, but what you said really wasn't exactly true. And I found out that there's more stuff going on and that you left some stuff out and you glossed over some other things. I will say, yes, you're exactly right because I can't possibly include everything in a talk like this. I don't think I even know everything to put in here in a talk like this, but I wanted to give you the basic structure and the outline of what's going on so that you can at least when you're, even if you're not doing this as your job on a, some future mission, you know how it works and you have a frame of reference to talk to somebody whose job it is. The major thing I wanted to get out of here is that there are both horizontal and vertical data flows on this diagram. So again, at the top level, we have the same thing. We have a web browser sending a PDF file to a web server, but that's an exchange. So you can think of the horizontal messages as exchanges of information. So the web browser is sending the PDF file to the web server. The next layer, we have the hypertext transport protocol. That's, you know, web browser talk, web browser speak, how they talk to servers. And there are HTTP messages that go back and forth. The HTTP layer doesn't really care or know that it's transporting a PDF file. It's just sending messages back and forth. The same at the TCP layer. This is the, you know, part of the TCP IP um uh protocols so tcp it doesn't know anything more than it's sending a stream of bytes etc so the horizontal things are exchanges and there are constraints on those exchanges you know the http has its own protocol where it says okay if you send me this message i'm going to reply with that message the tcp does the same thing and internet protocol does the same thing ethernet does the same thing each in its own way the vertical messages are transformation of data. So starting at the web browser, you can see that the web browser sends the PDF file to HTTP. The HTTP then translates that <clears throat> into messages, which it sends to the TCP layer. 
the TCP layer translates those messages into just a stream of bytes and sends bytes to the IP layer. The IP layer puts those bytes in packets and sends it to Ethernet. And the, then the Ethernet exchanges frames. So these are all really just different terms for very similar things. But the idea is that when you're traveling vertically, the data gets transformed in some manner. And when you're traveling horizontally, you're just exchanging messages according to the constraints of that protocol. So again, this is sort of the, the top layer of what uh, the top layer of the, the web browser to the web server. Uh, the, in this case, the pro, I should define some terms. So the, the horizontal exchanges, the, the, the technical term for what's being exchanged is called a protocol data unit. So each protocol here, HTTP, TCP, IP, Ethernet, defines a protocol data unit, and that's the thing on the horizontal line. The service data unit is the, the thing that is exchanged vertically. And again, I've simplified things here. There's actually more to it than just sending a raw HTTP message to TCP. But the major terms you have to remember here is that horizontal <coughs> changes protocol data units and vertical is transforming things with service data units. So it's just the generic name for stuff that gets exchanged horizontally or transformed vertically. So at this top level, the unit of exchange is the, the protocol data unit. You could think of it as the PDF file itself. This is sort of the user data that the user cares about. Um, at the HTTP layer, um, the message, the, the PDU is the HTTP message. So if you went and looked up the HTTP spec, it'll tell you exactly what what messages you can send, what messages you have to receive, and what you need to do with them. Um, addresses are, as you know, URLs. Um, there can be several protocols sort of mixed in to this one HTTP layer. There are options on the HTTP protocol, in other words. So you can do authentication to so that the user is confident that he's submitting to the right website and the Website is confident that they have the correct user. The user is who they say they, they are. Um, they can be for encryption for privacy. That's the HTTPS. Um, data integrity to make sure nobody tampers with the data. Um, I'm sort of this, so HTTP is a, a level seven protocol. In this example, I'm skipping over levels five and six. Sometimes the TLS and SSL, that's the security part and the privacy part for HTTP is broken out into its own layer at level six. Sometimes it's merged with HTTP at level seven. Level five is often merged with level four or it's not used. So the, you'll commonly see that there's, there's a lot of flexibility in how you assign things to layers. So we're skipping from level four now to level, from level seven now to level four. So TCP's job is to transport us this stream of bytes from the user to the, uh, to the uh, to, from the author to the conference website. So the PDU is really just a stream of bytes. So, but, but what TCP does for you, the concerns that it addresses, the value of it is that it guarantees that it delivers those bytes in order with nothing missing and nothing duplicated. So that's really addressing a, a huge concern. You now have, even if the, the, the network below TCP is unreliable, okay, it drops stuff, it gets disconnected, TCP will uh, you know, compensate for that and make sure that you get the bytes in order with no missing, with nothing missing and nothing duplicated. That's its job. That's, those are the concerns that it addresses. Um, the addressing is just the port number. So for, for HTTP, that's typically port 80 or port 88, 8080 sometimes they use. Um, so all TCP knows about is that is transport, doing reliable transport over an unreliable network of a stream of bytes. That's its job. 
the IP layer addresses different concerns. So the IP layer takes those that stream of bytes and puts them into packets. It uses, this is where IP addresses come in. This is the lowest layer where the data travels end to end. Um, so what this job, the job of this layer is to worry about routing and how data is gets from point A to point B. There may be many intermediate systems that the user never knows or cares about, but under the hood, it's IP's job to say, okay, I have five connections that I can use locally. Which connection do I send it to to get to my desired location? And that's the routing job. So that's a lot of what IP does. And that's a whole huge other topic about how to do network routing. But all of that happens sort of at the IP layer, and there's a lot of other protocols out there to sort of um, probe and track and understand sort of a dynamic changing network so that things can be routed and rerouted as the network changes. Okay. Then we go to um, ISO layer two data link. This is a point to point protocol. I have made a vast simplification here. In that, in effect, I'm assuming there's just a single Ethernet cable that goes from the author to the conference. In reality, there would be many other stops along the way, not necessarily all Ethernet. Um, it, in this case, what, what the Ethernet does is it takes the IP packets and puts them into frames, Ethernet frames. Um, you may have heard of a MAC address. You probably have. That's the address that Ethernet uses to route frames or to send frames. Um, and like I said, I've admitted many different intermediate hops between the author and the conference in this diagram. So we can talk a little bit about transformation. Um, so as data moves up and down the stack, it is transformed. So it goes from being a PDF file to an HTTP message to a stream of bytes, to IP packets, to ethernet frames. And this is sort of the separation of concerns. Each layer doesn't really care about um, what's, you know, what layers are above it and what layers are below it. It just knows its particular part of the job. The exchange is something ac according to two peers. So if you went and looked up the TCP protocol, it's not going to talk a lot about the SDU transformation. It's much more going to talk about what are the rules for two TCP protocol entities talking to each other, regardless of what layers are below it. So just forget about what layers are below it. Imagine the two TCP entities talk to each other directly. What are the rules for that conversation? And that's what the, um, that's what they have to meet. That's the, uh, that's the thing that they have to do. And each layer has its own set of protocols. So Ethernet does, IP does, TCP does, HTTP does. So if you look up the specs, that's a lot of what they talk about. What are those rules horizontally? So let me give you an example of sort of this sort of exchange. Um, in the TCP world, there's a famous thing called the three-way handshake. So this is a way of setting up and tearing down a connection between two TCP protocol entities. Um, you have to visualize sort of this state machine on the right, sort of one of these state machines at each end. One end is called the client. One end is, the other end is called the server. So typically the client follows the red path through the state machine. Typically the uh, server follows the blue path you start at the at the black dot up here at the top and if you start by entering the closed state the um the server then listens and then the client does an open and initiates a connection so there's a the top four states here are how to establish a connection once you're in the established state then other protocols, other parts of the protocol take over and you exchange data. When you're done exchanging data, you then use the bottom six states on this diagram to close out the, um, 
the connection. So how, I, I don't know, I, I guess I, I want to maybe ask a question here of the audience. How many of you all are familiar with this sort of concept of state machines or this sort of notation? State machines, yes. Looks like we had some hands raising. Thanks, thanks for that, Drew. State machines, yes. And we do have several people on this call that use SysML. Um, Perfect. So uh, I, I know when we were talking about this, you mentioned possibly just doing one of these on how to organize this in SysML. Um, th there's there's some people on this call that that would really resonate with. Okay. Okay. Well, that's not the focus of today, but it just right. just the just the concept of state machines. I wanted to make sure I wasn't you know completely talking past people. <laughs> Oh, no, this is incredibly valuable. We Thank also you. have um, several members of the flight software team here, including myself, which we, we're all familiar as well. Great, great. Thank you. So um, that's what that's the, the famous three way handshake. That's the state machine. So this is a constraint. This state machine, think of it as a constraint on the communication between the two TCP protocol entities. If you want to look at it another way, this is what's typically in SysML, at least is a sequence diagram. So again, the blue is server, yes, and the red is client. So this shows the exchange of messages, the order in which they're exchanged. So it takes three messages to establish the connection. Then you exchange whatever data you're gonna exchange. And then it takes another four messages to close out the transaction, close out the connection. So. If you want to get some extra credit, um, you can go ahead and sort of, you know, take this sequence of messages and trace through on the state machine diagram and make sure that it all works out correctly. <laughs> okay, so I've sort of explained a lot about sort of the transformation and exchange and um, the uh, you know, the, some, a little bit of a protocol, giving you a flavor of what a protocol looks like. Um, but what do the data structures look like? Because that's another large, important part of it. Um, one of the good things and or bad things about my job is that I have to be intimately familiar with all of the data structures on the, for, the space, for the space protocols. So it's, you know, for the... Uh, for the OCD part of my personality, that's really great, <laughs> but it's it's sort of uh, it's not always what I want to be thinking about. But you you have to know some of the particular, um, you know, the data structures that are used so that um, you can do it. And I find that space missions in particular tend to look, you know, if you're a user using a web browser to send a file, you're not going to look, know or care what IP packets were sent. But in the space business, you do. And they track and save all of those things. So when we get a frame on the space mission, we save the frame. And then if we extract packets from that frame, we save those packets too. So we have a complete record of everything that was exchanged at each level, which is from a terrestrial sense, or which is very different than how thing, people do this on a terrestrial level. In any case, each protocol data unit has the following structure very broadly. It has a header, it has a data portion, and sometimes they have a footer. Sometimes you don't have to use the footer all the time. They don't always define one, but sometimes it's there. Um, the header usually contains metadata. So source destination, size, um, stuff that's specific to your domain. The footer usually contains error correcting codes and things like that. Mm. Data the data portion, which is really the interesting part, contains information, the information being transmit transported, but usually that's, you know, at the highest level, that's user, that's your user data, and that's going to be very mission specific. So typically the protocols don't care what's in the, the data portion. It's just transporting. That's what's in the back of the truck. So if we look at an IP packet, an internet protocol packet, this is the header structure for it. So you can see this is, uh, this can be quite long. It's at least 120, it's at least 16 bytes, 128 bits long, but can be longer depending on the options that you use. 
Um, so the largest theoretical size for an IP packet is 65 or 64 kilobytes. Uh, the largest data portion for an, a single Ethernet frame is 1500 bytes. So maybe a little counterintuitively, a packet can be much larger than a frame. So packets usually must be split among many different frames, among a bunch of frames, and then reassemble on the other end. That's sort of one of the concerns that I was talking about. In other words, the the the, uh, the IP layer doesn't know or care that Ethernet has broke, taken its packets, broken them into pieces, and then reassembled them. That's the job of the Ethernet layer. And then Ethernet just presents a completed packet to the to the IP layer above. So in a perfect world, each layer wouldn't know anything about any of the other layers it's interacting with, either above or below. But we don't live in a perfect world. So things like quality of service, the latency, how long a message takes to go from one end to the other, the bandwidth, how much, how many bits per second can you transport? The jitter, like if you're doing video conferencing or audio conferencing, the, uh, you know, if your latency isn't, you know, perfectly constant, if it varies, if your latency varies over the course of your, your meeting, that's called jitter. Um, and that can affect audio and video. So you have to account for that. Uh, privacy, you know, in other words, encryption, authentication, making sure you know who you're dealing with, little passwords and usernames. Uh, all of these sort of things really are sort of, I would say they're cross-cutting. In other words, that no single layer is responsible for any particular quality of service. It's really the combination of layers that that result in the quality of service. So you're going to have to do, you know, understand how your layers work together when you're designing and analyzing them or and operating them to understand how this the interface performs as a whole. A lot of times I get questions about well, what layer is real? What's really going on here? They can't all be happening. You know, surely it always boils down to electrons or photons, right? And yes, that's true. You know, that's that's ultimately what what gets transported back and forth or electrons or photons or whatever you're using to, to send. Um, but as I've been trying to emphasize, each layer in the stack must perform its functions for the interface to work as a whole. So they all have to be true. I don't like using the word real, but they all have to be true. In other words, you, you have to be able to think about the TCP layer by itself and make sure that that's working properly before you start mixing it in with the other layers. So that's this is going back to what I said at the beginning, the separation of concerns. So I've been told that you are probably familiar with this quote. So all models are wrong, but some are useful. This is really just to emphasize that, that all of this layered stuff is just a model. It, it is not capturing all of the detail that uh, really goes on in, an implement, in, a, in a real world implementation of a protocol stack. So for that, you really have to look at the, the software or some of your layers are done in hardware at the hardware layer to understand what's really going on. But this is, I hope, a, a useful model, this layering of things I hope is useful for people to understand what's going on without having to get into all of that detail. So now we're gonna jump and, and talk about some of the Spacelink protocols, at least the ones that I'm familiar with. And in particular, in particular, we're gonna be talking about three of them. So the space link, what I, I'm calling the space link, is simply the RF link between the spacecraft and the antenna on the ground. Um, most missions, or certainly all of those with, I'm familiar with, use CCSDS standards for this link almost exclusively. So the CCSDS is the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems. They publish a huge number of standards for space communication. So we're only going to talk about three of them. Um, but each mission, it's sort of like uh, you know a menu. You can pick and choose which um, 
which protocols you want to use and assemble your stacks accordingly, depending on what your mission is, mission needs are and what your constraints are. So I'm going to show you one particular combination, which is commonly used for JPL missions, but that, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that that's the same as what you're planning to use for ABEX or what you would necessarily use for any other mission. So don't take this as the, the answer for all your missions. It's really just to um, uh, really just to illustrate the point and give an example of what what can be done. So I guess I've been talking a lot here. I guess I wanted to maybe pause for a second and see if there are any anybody out there with a question that's uh, uh, they've been trying to get in and I haven't been listening. There's one. Um, it's kind of tangential to talking about the CCSDS. For those that are unfamiliar, could you speak on what the difference between the CCSDS blue books versus green books versus magenta versus orange are? Oh gosh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, I'm not. I'm not going to know all the colors off the top of my head. The blue books are the official standards documents themselves. If you want to know exactly what the standard is and what the standard says, that's a blue book. If you want to sort of understand how the standard is supposed to work, how um, you know it fits in with other standards, why it was designed that way, you know, maybe a little more human friendly description because the blue books are very technical and very dense, and you have to have a lot of context to understand what they're saying. So that's a green book. If you want the context, that's sort of a green book that tells you how to use things um, and how to deploy things and combine them and how they work not just the details of what the spec is um, then i think magenta might be for proposals proposed standards you know it goes whether it's going through the standardization process it's it's a magenta book and that's about all the colors that i know so but i think if you start with the blue and the green that, that'll get you a long way thank you so much so this protocol is really with what a protocol stack that I'm familiar with from my work here at JPL. Um, and we do deep space missions, so stuff that's beyond Earth orbit. Um, so the characteristics of those missions are compared to, and I'll compare them to low Earth orbit missions here in a moment. But for deep space missions, we have long one way light times, sometimes an hour or more. Um, relatively low data rates and asymmetric data rates. In other words, we get maybe low megabits per second on downlink, but only a few kilobits per second for uplink. So very different data rates on the uplink and downlink. The downlink rates in particular could vary widely over the course of a year because of the changing distance of the Earth to the spacecraft, the uplink rates are low enough that they're not really affected by the distance. There's so much margin in, you know, in terms of decibels on the uplink rate that we can maintain a single uplink rate pretty much all the time because we've picked a very low one to begin with. Um, and the space link has its own sort of noise characteristics in terms of no the noise tends to be bursty. And if you ask me more about what that means, I'm not going to know. That's where it's where you need a telecom engineer. But you know, it has its own particular kind of, of noise, which influences then what type of error correction you need to have. So compared that with low with Earth orbiting missions, Earth orbiting missions typically have very short one way light times. So even if you're out around the moon, it's only a couple of seconds. So compared to an hour, that's really short relatively high data rates, megabits to maybe a gigabit. The data rates are stable over the time. They don't really change much over the course of the mission. Um, so LEO, if you're in low Earth orbit, the telecom passes are short. If you have a single ground station and you're in low Earth orbit, you're maybe, you maybe see the spacecraft for 10 minutes or so, something like that. Um, and you may only get one or two views per day from that one antenna. If you have multiple antennas, you can do more. Um, for geos geosynchronous orbits, the telecom can be continuous. If you have a dedicated ground station, you can always see the spacecraft. Um, for the deep space missions, it's a little bit different. So we typically get long telecom passes. We can get, depending on 
on the, the hemisphere the ground station is in northern or southern hemisphere of earth and other factors you know the telecom pass could be eight to ten hours long so it takes a very long time for the spacecraft to you know rise and set so really very different applications so that's why i'm saying that what i'm showing you here for deep space missions may or may not apply or may not may not may or may not be suitable for like an earth orbiting mission but I'm going to and I'm going to talk about the uplink and the downlink protocol stacks separately. So what that means is because they use very different protocols, they they tend to be unidirectional. So the uplink stack is really only concerned about sending things from the ground to the spacecraft, and vice versa for the downlink stack. So in that sense, it's very different from the terrestrial example, which was using the same stack for both directions. This uses a different stack in each direction. Um, so the, 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 in this example, we really have four protocol layers. We start off with um, I'm, what I've just called spacecraft commands. That's sort of the user layer. I'm putting that at layer seven. And those are specific to your mission, to your spacecraft. You know, the, it's whatever, you know, binary commands your spacecraft accepts. Then we jump all the way down to level to layer two. And this is the frame layer. So this is this is typical, at least for JPL missions. Other places like the Applied Physics Lab in Maryland, they tend to insert a packet layer between the commands of the TC frames. JPL tends not to do that, but that's just a choice. So that's an example of a variation. Um, in this example, we're, we're, we're not showing a packet layer, but you could have one. <clears throat> so layers, <clears throat> the, the TC frames, the CLTUs, and the symbols are all um, uh, um, CCSDS standards. So we put, in our case, we put the commands directly in the, the telecommand frames, the TC frames. Um, and that's a one-way send. Um, but what happens is those frames for error correction, error detection correction purposes are um, placed into what are called CLTUs, Command Link Transfer Unit, I think is the right acronym. It's at the end of the slides if you want to go take a look. Um, so one, a single transfer frame is broken up into a series of CLTUs. A CLTU is really also a series of code words, and each code word has a section of your original TC frame and then some check bits that have been added on for error detection and correction. And then at that level, you're still dealing with bits. I'm going to make a distinction between telecom bits and symbols here. If you know the distinction, if some of the software folks out there know the distinction between saying, quoting a, a, a network speed in terms of bits per second or in terms of baud, those are two different things. And that's exactly the difference between bits and symbols. So um, symbols are things uh, at the RF layer that can be translated to and from bits. Sometimes one bit corresponds to many symbols, if you depending on the type of coding you're using. but the key thing here to understand is that um, bits get translated into symbols before they're actually radiated on the RF link. Um, there's a lot more below OSI at or below OSI layer one in terms of the all the RF stuff. Again, that's telecom. So talk to your telecom engineer. So we can talk a little bit about the telecommand frames the TC frame structure. So on uplink, the TC frame structure is of variable length because like I said, in this world, uplink rates are very low, maybe you know a few thousand bits per second. And they don't want to waste space, waste time, you know, sending a fixed with a fixed size frame. So if you had a fixed size frame, that means you'd be spending, sending a lot of fill data if you have small messages and a large frame size. So to avoid that, for uplink, 
they make frame sizes variable. So the maximum size of a single frame is, is one kilobyte, 1024 bytes. Uh, this is the link to the blue book that specifies uh, about telecommand frames. You'll notice this does have a, a header, a data field, and a, an optional footer for error correction. So this will give you an idea of what's in the, um, the frame header. Um, the most important things I would say out of here are the spacecraft ID. Each spacecraft will have its own unique identifier up to 10 bits so that the spacecraft knows if it was really, if this frame was really meant for it or some other spacecraft. It has a virtual channel ID. This is used for multiplexing. So you can have sort of multiple different virtual streams of frames on the same physical channel. And then the frame length. So this tells you how long the frame is. So the spacecraft has to look at that to decode the frame. And then a sequence number. So this just goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way until it wraps around after 255. And this is just a very simple sort of way to detect if there are gaps or duplicate frames. So this is sort of what maybe what I just said about the four different sort of fields that are typically used. Not all the missions use all the fields. The variable length is, gives flexibility. Um, there is also a thing you can think of with transfer frames, and that's called randomization. So randomization doesn't really change the content. The purpose of randomization is to protect against long runs of zeros or ones in your data. So <clears throat> unrandomized data, like you might have if you put commands in a transfer frame, may, you know, they, they often have long runs of zeros or ones in them. And those are, those are bad for radio receivers because it's difficult for them to stay in lock. It's, they can lose sync sort of, um, if you have long runs of zeros or ones, it doesn't know, well, was that 25 zeros or 26 zeros and the timing can get off. So the randomization, it's the, the bits are exclusive ORD with a known pattern and that it's not encryption or anything like that, but its sole purpose is just to help reduce the long runs of zeros or ones so that your receiver has less of a chance of losing lock on your signal on the bits in particular. So below the, um, if I can jump back to the here, now we've moved from the TC frames to the CLTUs. So a TLT, CLTU is, is really three things. It's a start sequence of 16 bits, which is a fixed known sequence. So you can always tell when a new one starts. <coughs> It's a series of code words. In this case, it's using BCH coding. So um, each code word, which is the original data plus the check bits is 64 bits. And then there's a tail sequence, which is a special bit pattern, um, which causes the decoder to fail intentionally so that it knows that we've reached the end of the CLTU. So if we look at a single code word, now we're looking at a single code word here, these 64 bits of BCH code word, um, it contains 56 bits of information. This is the original message unchanged from what you fed in. Then seven parity check bits, and then one filler bit to make it an even number of bytes, to make it 64 bits instead of 63. And the purpose of this is for error detection and correction. The nice thing about BCH codes is that when you're designing your code, you can actually choose um, how many bits you want to, how many errors you want to be able to correct. So the, what, what uh, CCSDS has chosen is a code that can detect, it can do one of two things. You can run it in a mode where it detects two errors and it can correct a single error. So that single error correction, dual error detection. You can also run it in a mode where it can detect up to three bits, that's triple error detection, TED. But in that case, 
if you can detect, it's a trade-off, you can detect three-bit errors, but you can't correct anything if you run it in that mode. So this is actually a pretty, as BCH go, codes go, a pretty weak one. They use them a lot on the ground for, for cell phones and for other sort of RF communication, and they use much stronger codes that can correct many more bits. But for a spacecraft, they chose a very uh, uh, um, a simpler code to implement that was you know easier to implement on, on spacecraft hardware. So a CLTU can contain any number of code words. There is no length field. You're relying on the the uh, the fixed bit pattern, the start sequence, which is EB90 in hex, and then the end sequence, the C5 blah 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 79. That causes the BCH decoder to fail. So you can have any number of code words in a CLTU. I talked about the single error correction, double error detection versus triple error detection. This was a little confusing for me when I first ran into it. The BCH codes are specified by CCSDS as, quote, modified, but they don't really tell you how they've been modified. And really, it's very simple. So they've appended the fill bit to make it the integer number of bytes. That's modification number one. And modification number two is they invert the flip. They invert the parity bits. They change ones to zeros and zeros to ones. Just, again, to avoid this long run of zeros or ones. Um, as I was saying, BCH code, BCH coding is actually a large family of codes. And you know, there are many different um, designs you can have within the BCH family. Um, this is really important for uplink because we don't want the spacecraft to ever receive corrupted data, corrupted commands. Um, uh, but this is sort of at the boundary of where I would work and where a telecom engineer would work. So if we were designing this system from scratch, you would want to talk to your telecom engineer and, and you know, talk about whether we need randomization, whether you need BCH coding, or there are alternatives to BCH coding, like low density parity checking um, and other things. So you, you have to talk to your telecom engineer and make those sort of choices. So really there are many, many other options for building stacks. This is just a very, very simple one. Um, you can choose different protocols for the layers. Um, within protocols, there are many different options, BCH versus LBPC coding, that's low, low density parity check, so that's one thing. There are different types of frames you can use. You can choose to add packets or not add packets. Um, how you pack data into the top level, in other words, what, what sequence of things you're sending at the very top of the stack is completely mission dependent and up to you. So one typical scheme I've seen is to put one command inside each TC frame. That makes it very simple for the, the spacecraft to decode things. There's, it doesn't have to put two frames together to get a command. Um, the fact that TC frames have a variable length field is very convenient here. So you, you know that seems to be a common pattern. Uh, uh, you know if. Uh, if you want to route that command to a different part of the spacecraft, you have to have enough information associated with the command to do that, or you, sometimes people use a packet layer to do that routing. Uh, similarly, often, you know, for, for uplink passes, if you have eight or 10 hours pass for one of these missions, you typically don't have that much, you don't need that much time to do your uplink. So what the ground typically does is it sends a, um, uh, a sequence of idle bits. So just alternating zeros and ones to keep the spacecraft receiver in lock. So that is the end of the uplink discussion. Any questions on the uplink? Okay. So move it, now we're going to move on to the typical downlink stack. So this, you'll notice this has a few more layers, and you'll see how it compares to the uplink stack. It's 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 different in some important ways. Um, one thing that's similar is its flow is unidirectional. 
Um, in this example, we're showing a packet layer on the downlink. GPL tends to use packets on downlink. Um, okay, so we have uh, the, the telemetry at the very top layer. Then we have space packets, AOS frames. That stands for Advanced Orbiting System. It's basically the downlink frame. So it's a different structure than the TC frame or the uplink frame, but it serves the same purpose at the same layer. Then instead of um, um, instead of um, BCH coding on downlink, we use something called turbo coding. Uh, it's more complicated to decode, but on the ground, when you're decoding it on the ground, that's okay. So we're going to talk about sort of we're going to start talking about with uh, start talking about the structures here with space packets. So again, there is no footer in the space packet, but we have a primary header, an optional secondary header, and then a user data field. And these can be quite big, up to sixty-four kilobytes. Um, this is the packet primary header. Um, So the 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 important the important uh, structures in here, the important parts of this um, uh, primary header are the uh, application process identifier, the app ID. What that does is that actually identifies the piece part within the spacecraft that originated the packet. So packets are typically created by different subsystems within the spacecraft itself or by different science instruments within the spacecraft. And the, ap the application ID, the application process identifier will tell you where that, that packet ident originated. It will tell you the format of the data content. So, you, so the ground knows what's supposed to be in the packet. And a lot of other things are keyed off of that um, application process identifier. The packet sequence count is also important. This is an exact equivalent of what you saw on the uh, uplink packet, uplink frames. Um, so this is just a simple way to check for continuity of packets to see if anything's missing. And then again, packets are variable lengths, so we have a length field. Packets typically have a secondary header. So the time code field, in my experience, is almost always used. So this is where the spacecraft would put the time, put a timestamp to say when the packet was created. Um, there also is this ancillary data field. So sometimes missions, including Clipper, um, will add their own information into this this header, into the secondary header, and associated with each packet. So for Clipper. We use that this field to do um, identification of science data. So each science, for just to simplify things, each science observation gets a unique identifier, and we put that data that identifier in this ancillary data field, and that way we can tell which packets go with which observations, and that actually lets us trace back and determine which spacecraft commands generated that data. The transfer frame is similar to what you saw there. The big difference here is the downlink transfer frames, the AOS transfer frames are fixed length. So it just puts as much stuff into the transfer frame as it can. There will usually be some fill data. Um, again, this is a primary header and a trailer for uh, typically error correction. Um, but, and then the main part of the, the data is carried in the transfer frame data field. The primary header has no, it, it has no length um, uh, field in it because the, the AOS frame is fixed length. Each mission can choose the length they want to use. So CCSDS doesn't specify the length, but each mission chooses a length. And both this flight spacecraft and the ground know what that length is, so they don't have to put it in each frame. Again, we have the spacecraft ID, a, another virtual channel ID, like you saw on uplink. So this lets you have multiplex different streams, virtual streams on the same physical channel. You have a frame counter, 
Um, and then at the end, you can have the um, a field which tells you whether you're going to use the error correction. Uh, so I think I covered most of this. The fixed length allows optimization and scalability of processing. So you're, you know, the typically the downlink bit rates are much higher than the uplink bit rates. So your ground is processing data very quickly and the fixed length field helps. Fixed length transfer frame helps with that. Um, and again, you can do randomization on the downlink just to like you do on the uplink for the same reason to help keep your receiver in law. Hey, Mark, can I ask you a quick question? Sure, of course. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, this, this may have a, a simple answer, but in the transfer frame header, the spacecraft ID was 10 bits. And in the AOS header, it's eight bits here. Uh, can you tell mm. us a little bit about, about the difference there? That is a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that as to why that is. I always thought it was 10 bits, but if we're looking, if I'm looking back on the slides here, we can get back a little bit. I want to say it's slide 30. Spacecraft ID 10 bits versus eight. You're right. I had not, frankly, I had not noticed that before. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to look it up. Um, I'm impressed that you noticed that, honestly. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we'll save it for part two. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So now we're getting below the frame layer. Um, and we're doing turbo coding instead of BCH coding. Turbo coding works very differently than BCH coding. So turbo coding. Um, the H coding basically output one symbol out for each bit that comes in. So one bit in, one symbol out. Turbo coding could do one symbol in to either two, three, four, or six symbols out, depending on what they call the coding rate. So the length of the code word for the same number of input bits changes depending on the coding rate that you're using. So uh, that's it's a little it's a more complicated code it's um, I, I tried to look this up but apparently you can't characterize it simply in terms of the number of bits errors detected or corrected because it depends where in the frame the bit errors occur so I think it's good at doing bursty noise where all the error bits are clumped together um, so that's some of the distinctions uh, they used to use something called it, it back when I started, they didn't have, they weren't using turbo coding for JPL missions, and they would use a combination of things called convolutional coding and read Solomon coding. And so this is just a bit of a historical note. The, those were replaced, turbo coding replaced both of those things. So turbo coding does the job of both the original convolutional codes and read Solomon codes. Um, don't get me, I don't know the answer to what the difference between convolutional coding and read Solomon is, but turbo code does both of them. So, so we actually use convolutional and read Solomon, um, a, a while back, uh, this is before we actually launched anything, but, um, it, it, it took too much bit overhead. Uh, it increased the size of the data by something like 228%. And hmm. that was, that was too much. The, so we, um. It was it was easy to decode because you just had the Viterbi decoder, but um, I do think that we'll be switching to Turbo. Okay. Is this related to the conversations last semester where CNDH is trying to determine the memory sizes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, okay. Well, you probably know more about that than I do. I highly doubt that. I I doubt that <laughs> severely. <laughs> Okay, um, so really, just let's get a. I want to, you know, take a step back. We've covered a lot of ground. Covered, talked about a lot of data structures and a lot of different layers. This is an overview of all the CCSDS um, protocols that they define, 
And I've put a star next to the three that we've talked about so far. So you can see there's a lot of other stuff out there, even just in the CCSDS world um, that we have not talked about. Um, some of the things are just evolutionary, like AOS frames replaced TM frames, which were telemetry frames. So those use, that's the old downlink frame format, TM, and AOS is the new one, which we've used for 20 plus years now. Um, there are some higher level protocols like CFDP, which is stands for CCSDS file delivery protocol that takes care of, um, you know, retransmitting missing data and make sure, making sure that the ground or the spacecraft receive a complete file. There's something called delay tolerant or disruption tolerant networking. That's the that's a combination of the BP there, the bund what's called the bundle protocol, and then one of one or more one of the protocols below it. The one I'm familiar with is called LTP. That's a lick lighter transport protocol. So the combination of BP and LTP is called delay tolerant networking, and that's that does the same sort of job. It may it makes sure you get a complete copy. But it's much more sophisticated, especially when you're doing um, relay networks. So if you're not talking directly from your spacecraft to Earth, but you have perhaps other spacecraft who are relaying messages for you, that's where you would use bundle protocol. And in fact, different parts of the same file can take different paths through different spacecraft getting to the ground and it all gets reassembled. So that's a very interesting I have not seen a mission that uses it, not the, that I've, that at least that I'm familiar with, but it's very interesting. It is used a lot to, on terrestrial like cell phone networks. Um, so we've really only talked about three of, you know, more than a dozen of the protocols that are here. So my message here is that we've only scratched the surface. There's a whole lot more to, to, to look at if you're designing or using some of these protocols. Are there any um, ISO standards that contain detailed overviews of some of the protocols that we haven't gone over today? ISS standards? ISO standards. ISO standards? Yeah. Well, ISO and CCSDS are different organizations. So were you asking about? I guess so, a docu like documentation so the I for the detailed implementation. I guess I, I'm not sure. Can you can you rephrase the question? Can you ask it again? I think I, are there I any sources for I guess reading more information on some of the protocols that we didn't go over in this entire protocol stack? Okay, so in what we're in what's on this page, your main source would be go to the ccsds ccsds.org website and look up the various colored books for each of these protocols. Um, I will say the bundle protocol and the LTP protocol really actually did not originate with CCSDS. Those were Internet Engineering Task Force protocols. The CCSDS has sort of adopted them and you know put their own cover sheet on them, but they're originally an IETF construction. So if you're interested in those for DTN, you might look in the uh, IETF document but really you know the blue book is the, the the gory details of the spec and the green book is the um sort of the more of the 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 gist how to use it what it's for why it was designed that way is that sort of what you were thinking yes. of yeah i don't i don't know of any resource outside of the ccsds documents okay thank you i appreciate it Okay, then um, this is this is a, a diagram that I stole from the Europa Clipper mission. This was a diagram I did to sort of explain all of the error detection and correction that's going on on both the uplink and downlink. So this is sort of an integrated view looking at a single concern, or two concerns, if you will, error detection and error correction. Um, so starting on the left, 
The solid boxes are on the ground. The, the white shaded boxes are in the spacecraft. Um, so you can see that the, there's some ground processes, which we, I'm not going to concern ourselves with here, um, that go on. But for the uplink, there's really three kinds of, or well, yeah, three, let me, let me call them three kinds of error detection and correction going on here. So we have the telecommand frame forward error correction field or frame error correction field. We have the BCH codes, which we've talked about. And then, so that's the error detection and correction. And then we have two um, reporting capabilities. We have an uplink file accountability report. Every time we send a file, we get confirmation that it was received on the spacecraft, and that's sort of a higher level accountability. And then this ADP accountability report, that's the accountable data product. That is that identifier that I mentioned we put in the secondary header of the packets that's tied all the way from our planning software, our commands in the planning software, through the commands, and then down in the packets. So this is truly sort of like the full circle life cycle traceability number that we can use. If you know the accountable data product, you know which commands created data, and you can find all of the data created by those commands. Um, if you're on board the spacecraft, there's a lot of error detection and correction just on board. So uh, we we often use we have several different data buses, but the two two I'm going to talk about here are Spacewire and UART. So those both have their own error detection and correction mechanisms. Um, the BDS and the EFS that you see sort of here, those are our uh, data storage devices, and they have their own error detection and correction for while the data is being stored. Um, on the downlink, we have the AOS frame forward uh, frame error correction field and turbo codes. And then we have a huge number of accountability reports. So we have accountability reports for packets, um, for spacecraft packets, for instrument packets, for downlinked files. And then we have um, another second type of packet cap report and a transfer frame cap report. So we do a lot of accountability reporting and a lot of error detection and correction. And so this sort of gives you just one, an end-to-end -end view of one slice of the, uh, the, the, the stack stuff that I've uh, been talking about. So that's, this is really sort of the, uh, the, the end of my question. I have a end of my talk here. I have a couple of um, resources. This is mostly the CCSDS websites, a couple of specific links to the things that I talked about. Uh, AOS frames, TC frames, space packet protocol. Um, I do have a question, sort of a discussion question. So this is a throwback to um, the, uh, we, you saw these diagrams earlier, the state machine and the sequence diagram. Do you think this sort of a protocol would work well with a long one-way lifetime, sort of maybe of an hour. Anyone want to hazard a hazard an answer there? Is this a good design for that sort of an environment? Flight software team. Well, I feel like if we answer, it might be cheating. <laughs> um, so it likely would not work with a one-way lifetime of one hour, just due to the fact that you would have a You'd likely run into a timeout error mm -hmm. consistently. You could manually yeah. set a, an incredibly long uh, timeout. But I believe that you mentioned when you get to that level of it taking that long, the time is going to be somewhat variable. Right. And, and I think, so, so yeah, you're, you're right. Um, uh, even if you could get it to work, even if you manage the timeouts so you could get it to work, it would take you forever to set up and tear down the connection, let alone transport any data. So not useful. So it, it really is context dependent on what protocols you choose to use. Um, I have one more quote here. Does any, is anyone here familiar with uh, Grace Hopper? She was uh, famous, she, she helped build the compiler for COBOL back in the 50s. 
Um, she was really a, a, a pioneer in computing in the Navy. She was a rear admiral. And, and her point really is that uh, she was, this, is, this quote is from the early 60s, and she's talking about some early data processing that her group was doing. They were trying to process data. I don't know what the data was, but they had data that was put in, they ran a lot of processes on it, and then there's data that put out. And she sort of tells a story in this quote that they started out by thinking, well, what procedures do we need to run on this data at each step? And they quickly found out that that was the wrong way to think about the problem. The, the right way to think about the problem was to think about, well, what's the relationship between the data, the data structures at each point? What relationships do we want to be true? And then the procedures fall much more cleanly out of that. And it's much cleaner to state to explicitly state the relationships between pieces of your data rather than just thinking about it at the algorithmic level. So that's sort of, you want to think of it that way. It's sort of like the data constrains your algorithm, and that's the way you should think about it. And with that, I'm done. And thank you all for letting me uh, talk at you for an hour or so. And it's been a really fun experience for me. Mark, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for uh, giving us your time. Thank you for uh, all of the preparation. Um, Mark, Mark spent weeks putting this together, and we, we really appreciate you putting in that time and effort so thank you yes thank you i've i've worked on three satellite missions and i i didn't see the communication side of things but there's a lot of things that like i saw that's like we definitely did not do that and should have and i yeah this, this was excellent this this will be a very helpful reference for like future missions that we'll be working on yeah. And definitely thank you from the flight software team. Um, communications are still something that we haven't exactly tackled yet. So this will definitely be invaluable for us moving forward. Okay, great. I'm um, just, whoever was talking the time before, can you give me a sort of a, an example of one of the things that you might have done differently? It was a bunch of the stuff with like, going back um, with basically organizing bits for certain things to identify certain sections where it's like this is like these particular bits are for such and such things like there's some like um some sections where like that like um there were some things that we could have done that could have been organized better so like packet ids like we had stuff for that but then some stuff was kind of vague um like or like like vague on our end like where sure. um like we'd have packets and they're like pretty bare bones information where it's like if we have anything where um we have um any kind of losses where like we have like missing packets or anything like that was a nightmare to try to stitch stuff together or um it's it's been a few years since I worked on that stuff, but so it was the header structures that you think were. It was yeah, it was some header structure stuff, um, and just kind of general, just organization a little bit, because we we were all doing everything basically completely from scratch, because mm -hmm. um, we're a bunch of students, we don't know anything, <laughs> so. Um, but seeing how some of the other people do it that actually know what they're doing, um, very very helpful. <laughs> Well, great. Okay, I'm I'm glad I I'm glad uh, you all found this useful. Yes, very. Mark Sorrell, thank you very much. Appreciate you. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, the spacecraft seminar series uh, is concluded. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining, and uh, have a lovely night. <laughs>